Today's video is all about emails as a way and a tool to communicate with people. Our email etiquette, which is all about how we use our emails and our email reputation. And finally, how to stop creating email anxiety for ourselves and other people we send emails to. We all seem to have different expectations when it comes to how we use, draft and send emails and what is and isn't appropriate. What I understand and know is that no one is ever given any formal training on how to draft, use emails. We simply seem to be thrown into it and expect to know how to draft and send these amazing emails that will achieve our desired outcomes. Did you know that we send 306 billion emails every day? 306 billion emails every day. And 50% of those messages and emails get misread. 50%. My first work experience and first impressions of work emails. I have a law degree and my first role was to work as an employment law paralegal for a very small law firm in England. My role was to work with so many files and alongside lawyers, my role was to make sure that they are up to date, that files are up to date and stored away safely. As I was doing lots of photocopying, I had an opportunity to read some of these emails and court cases at the same time. I read so many emails from solicitors, barristers, clients, so many different parties, and it all looked super serious and formal to me. This is where I learned that emails are actually used as evidence, that we can send letters by attaching a PDF document, or indeed that email alone, email body alone, can be viewed and sent as a letter. I quickly realized that our work emails actually don't belong to us, they belong to organizations we work for, and I learned that I should be really careful how I use my emails and what I say in my emails because they are disclosable as evidence. I believe that this first work experience and experience of dealing with work emails has had huge impact on how I use emails and how I draft emails. Before I simply start in my new role, I tend to spend good quality time with my manager. I really want to understand what sort of email culture they have, workload, productivity, efficiency issues, and what they like to see from their employees in terms of key behaviors. As a more recent example, I have started partnering a new executive lead for the portfolio I currently support. In my first meeting with him, we quickly discussed how we can support each other and how we can work together as a team. One of my questions was around emails and whether he reads emails and his views of emails and what he would like me to send him on a regular basis. He shared with me that, for example, he's not really great at reading emails but he would like weekly updates from me, ideally to send them every Friday so that he can read them every Monday morning before executive meetings. He would like me to put in the subject line HRBP weekly update and he has created a folder with my name in his email inbox where he can save my emails and just move them easily across and read them when he's free. We have also agreed that we should have bi-weekly meetings until he gets up to speed with the portfolio, which will then change to monthly meetings. And if I need to speak to him in between these meetings, he would like me to send him a text and then he will call me as soon as he can that day and vice versa. And this is what I call good quality contracting with your new senior leadership team, department heads, executive leads, whoever you support from time to time. This is applicable to every single role, not just human resources business partners. It will help me simply not overthink as to how he would like to work with me. And I genuinely look forward to working with this new executive lead. Let's discuss two CC BCC so is clearly who you are sending your emails to, someone who needs to do something with your email. CC stands for carbon copy and unwritten rules around CC is if you are copying people in, it's pretty much for their awareness, but they don't have to do anything with it. What I suggest you also do if you are copying people in is to make absolutely clear if it's for their information and if you need them to do something with that email. BCC stands for blind carbon copy. I'm personally not fond of BCC because I just don't like to hide anything from the person I'm sending my email to. And when I now think about it over the last 10 years, I don't think I have ever sent an email to anyone and included someone's email in 
the BCC section. It just feels a little bit dishonest and I personally have nothing to hide from anyone I'm dealing with. And I know sometimes people forward emails to, for example, their law managers or other parties once they've actioned something, which is a little bit time consuming. So I would rather copy that person in and simply say, Susan, for example, this is only for your information we can discuss in our meeting later. It's as simple as that. However, BCC section does offer a good solution when you are sending an email to a large number of people whose emails are private and confidential and who are not happy for their emails to be sent. So therefore we can send this email, make sure that we put our email in the to section and then BCC everyone else with an explanation to sort of say a large number of people has been BCC into this email because they're not happy for their emails to be shared. It's as simple as that. I do like to be very open and transparent in my email and communication. How to deal with a confusing email. Erica Dewan in her book, Digital Body Language, shares amazing examples when it comes to email etiquette and how to take it to another level. Erica suggests that when we find ourselves confused by the email we received, that we should ask ourselves if we are confused with the medium, if we are confused with the tone, or if we are confused with the actual message. If it's the medium, switch to a different one. Sometimes, and most of the time, a quick telephone conversation is better than any email. If the tone is an issue, give the other person the benefit of the doubt and respond with facts. For example, I'm working on this presentation as agreed. It will be with you by 5 p.m. today as promised, and I'm free for a phone call tomorrow morning if you have any feedback or requests around it. I would like to add that if you receive an email that's clearly asking you to do something but you are not really sure what they mean, I would really encourage you to pause there and initiate to have a meeting with the person who sent you this confusing email. There is nothing worse than you assuming what they want from you, what they need from you and you progressing to actually deliver against that action when in fact it could be that they want something else. So if you find yourself a little bit confused with the request or instructions, whatever they've asked you to do, it is best to respond with, I do have a couple of questions. Could we have a quick phone call or a video call later today or tomorrow morning? Because I would like to get certain clarity before I simply proceed with actioning your email. This part is all about passive aggressive messages that I'm sure most of us are guilty of. I know some of these I have used in the past and some of them are still potentially used in my emails due to the formality and the training I've had around using emails. I think with these examples, try and stick to the context rather than to take it as a general rule. Sometimes it's still okay to use some of this, but there has to be a good context around it. I assume you're doing this for me. I will take it from here. Am I missing something? As per my last email, for future reference, just to be sure we're on the same page going forward. Another drafting tip I have for you to start implementing straight away is to remove using a word just from our drafting style. Let me show you the context. I am just getting in touch to ask if you have had a chance to review the presentation I sent you last week. I'm getting in touch to ask if you have had a chance to review the presentation I sent you last week. As you can see, the second sentence is much clearer, concise and simply delivers facts rather than our day-to-day -day language that may not be suitable for email drafting style. For the last part of this video, I would like to take you through how can we avoid creating email anxiety for ourselves and other people. And as I was trying to prepare for this part, I actually came up with a checklist that you can download from my digital store. Let me take you through some of them. Before you simply decide to send an email, ask yourself if it needs to be sent by email at all. Sometimes a quick telephone conversation is all you need. However, if you decide it needs to be an email, think about the following. Think about who needs to be included in your email. Use reply all with care. Reply all is usually used as a one-off team announcement. Always check correct name spellings before you press send. In fact, my tip is to include all recipients once you have drafted your email and happy with it, rather than before or while you're drafting an email. You would be surprised how many people have done it and pressed send button by accident. 
Think about what you want them to do once they read your email. Seek to address who, what, and when needs to be done by as you draft your emails. So always cover the three W's as a drafting model. Think about how much context or information you need to provide. Ask yourself if there is any way they could read it differently to what you're trying to achieve. If yes, make it super clear and put yourself in their shoes. Do not assume that they know as much as you do. Think about your writing style and tone of email. Switch from do this, can you, to I would be grateful if you could do this by Friday. It simply sounds nicer and you will build better and respectful working relationships. Make your subject line super clear. Action required, approval required, weekly update, etc. Don't leave it blank or vague. Always embed hyperlinks as it's going to look super clean and neat. And also you are helping a person simply click on it rather than having to copy paste the link. If you're not sure how to address people, simply double check with your manager and colleagues and look at their previous email if they've emailed you before and how they have addressed you. In my experience, it is best to stick to dear and hi. If you are sending emails to someone you do not know or you've never spoken to before, ensure your full email signature is included with a full job title and your contact details. If you're not sure how to sign off your emails, you can simply say kind regards or best wishes. Make sure you attach relevant documents you are referring to. I have seen so many beautifully crafted emails with only a few seconds later for another email to appear to say, I'm really sorry, please see attached as well. Think about the timing when you send your emails as well. Don't assume that people work super early or super late. And when it comes to how long it takes to respond to, any, to an email, I would say on average one day, which is 24 hours, sometimes two days, 48 hours. But at the same time, if you've got an email and you know it's going to take you more than a day or two, simply respond with saying, I've got your email, thank you for sending it. I will come back to you by next Monday. Always ask yourself if you are happy if other people see your email in case they forward it onto someone else. Think about your email reputation and feedback you would get if you asked other people to give you feedback on your writing style. Some emails can be super clear, punchy, easy to follow versus messy, too detailed, essay type emails that not many have time to read and decide for their meaning. Always stick to one email chain or thread for the same topic and avoid sending separate emails for the same topic can be really confusing and it can really irritate people. You could simply say, regarding this topic, could we please stick to this email chain going forward when we need to interact with each other about it. Never send emails when distressed or angry. If you find yourself in this situation, please pause and respond to your email the following day. Think before you send an email to someone who is on holiday. Sometimes we simply assume that they will absolutely be up to speed and get our messages. It is best not to send them and simply set up a meeting with the person when they are back from their holiday and take them through full updates and everything that they need to know. I'm sure that they will really appreciate to have this conversation. And if they do need any written email communication, you can send it after the meeting. If you are dealing with a contentious matter where you email about, double check with your manager how you should discuss the relevant matter via email. Never talk about other people in a negative light in your emails. It will not look good as work emails can be disclosed and it's simply unprofessional. Discuss with your manager, customer, clients, stakeholders, email communication, as well as other communication channels and how they prefer to work with you. And to simply finish it off, Think about what you genuinely like and dislike about emails and simply approach it that way to make sure you are providing your recipients, people you're sending emails to, clarity, guidance, whatever you need it really, whatever you appreciate to get, make sure that you send it in return as well. That's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know when it comes to your own email etiquette, drafting style, whether you've had any formal training, what was your learning journey like when it comes to how you use emails and how you actually maximize these relationships when it comes to communicating through emails and whether you find them effective as a way to communicate with people and get the business done. See you in the next video. Bye for now.